Welcome everybody, uh, we're just about on time, we've got time. Um, welcome to the subcommittee of South West London Joint OSC, uh, our enlarged subcommittee, because as you realise we invited all uh, representatives of all our uh, partner boroughs in South West London, it's good to see you here. Welcome to Sutton. Um, there are no uh, fire alarms, if it is a fire alarm, please follow the, uh, the various signs uh, and please be behind me. <laughs> okay. Um, right, okay, so if we could start off, um, we have we got any apologies for absence? We had apologies from Councillor Lower and Councillor Critchard and Councillor Gray, um, the substitute of Councillor Francis. Did you say it's Fraser, not Fraser? Oh, Fraser, Fraser. Yeah, Councillor Fraser. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Okay, that's all right. That's all right. Okay, uh, have we got any declarations of interest from anybody regarding items on the agenda? No. Good, thank you very much. Minutes of the last meeting was on the 4th of July. Uh, those members who were there, have they got any comments? No. Uh, no. You no. <laughs> yes. So, thank you very much. So, we accept those as a true record. Thank you very much. Um, now, uh, a, a slight change to the agenda. I have uh, allowed Kosh to want to make some statements regarding uh, some information that's come to light and they would like to, to make some in make the committee aware of some information regarding uh, the proposals around transfer and acute services. I'm quite happy to let them uh, let, let Sandra uh, Ash speak uh, and then we can via myself and the committee members, if we want to pick anything up with uh, the officers from the CCDs, we'll do it that way. So Sandra, you're very welcome. Please take a seat. Um, Usually three minutes, but uh, I'll be generous tonight. And uh, yeah, I know you've got a lot you want to tell us, so uh, not too long. But uh, I'll, I'll give you a bit of notice if I think we need to uh, to, to, to wind things down a little bit. Okay. Over to you. Um, do you know how to use the mic? Oh, I think so. Is that all right? It's clean back. It's a group up in the middle. Yeah, it looks okay. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, my name is Sandra Ash and I'm here representing uh, the COSH campaign, uh, Keep Us in Head Hospital, and also Keep Our Heads in Hospital. Um, and one of the main reasons I'm here tonight is to ask the scrutiny committee to actually refer this really dangerous plan back to the Secretary of State for Health. We believe it's to be a very dangerous plan and have serious impact on the health and possibly lives of people living in uh, our area. Um, we believe that this plan stems directly from the STPAD plan, where councils um, should have been involved in the making of the plan. It appears really now that the councils are being told what the plan is and asking to rubber stamp it. Um, we uh, understand that with the STP plan was told that it had to cut locally a billion pounds in costs, and the way that you were going to go about it was to cut treatments, to cut prescriptions, to cut clinics, to cut entire departments and possibly even close hospitals. And the STP plan, as published, said that the plan was to reduce the number of acute hospitals in South West London from the current five to four, or possibly down to only three. We already have fewer beds than um, England on average in our area. Um, fewer beds per thousand Can population. I just cut in that you're straying off the uh the main topic of this subcommittee well, is the particular proposals around the, the possible recommissioning and yeah. that hasn't even uh, been published yet in a public consultation. No, no. It, so it, I think you need to slightly narrow the, uh, what, what you're trying to uh, address in the committee. Well, I'm, I'm asking the committee, your subcommittee to refer this whole plan back to Secretary of State because we believe it to be dangerous, we believe it will have bad impacts, we if believe I come in there, it's I about come in there, finance, yeah, right. Not in order care. to refer it to the Secretary of State, yes. we have to have a formal proposal. There is no formal proposal uh, for us to go into formal, or for CCGs to go into formal consultation. 
we are not a mandatory scrutiny committee. We don't become a mandatory scrutiny committee until such time as the CCGs jointly put that public consultation out. So if you wanted to have a discussion like this is when we move to the formal mandatory consultation, because we've had reflections about consultation with uh, the public, etc., etc., but there's been nothing formal laid on the, on the table regarding the particular IHT proposals that are being discussed at the moment. Well, that's one of the things that we are very concerned about, actually, because when this um, plan... evidence that it would improve anything. We've only been given people's opinions. There seems to be no research to back up their claims. In fact, in areas where this has happened, there has been serious detriment to the public in those areas, and there's plenty of that on record. We've asked for evidence, we've given none. We cannot comment on the detail of the CCG's plan because they haven't given us it. All we can go on is the scant evidence in their published documents on which they've engaged. We are in the, as a scrutiny committee, we are in the same position. We have the evidence that is before us at the moment. We have no proposals um, to work with. We, we, we have a, a, some information that they've enabled to talk to our public uh, across the spectrum. But we really, as a mandate, we have to wait for the mandatory committee because colleagues are working on at the moment. That's why we are an interim uh, scrutiny committee. And if you look at the items on the agenda, that's why we want to talk to our colleagues uh, in the CCGs on behalf of our residents regarding consultation. So that's the main. What I think you might have wanted to bring up tonight was, was some concerns around the estates of St. Helena and Exeter. Absolutely. And I'm more than happy for you to address us and then we will ask questions of the CCG regarding okay. the estates. Absolutely. I mean, um, I'm, I, I, um retain the right to come back to you and ask you to refer this to the Secretary of State because I think it's very important. Other areas have done so and they have won the case. So I think it's really important that you should do the same. And I would like you to invite us back to talk on that as soon as possible, please. Uh, regarding the Secretary of State, this, the South West London Committee can refer to the Secretary of State right. and each individual borough can refer to the Secretary yep. of State if it so wishes. And, and Merton has made a public statement that they wish to refer it to the Secretary of State right. if they want to individually. Sutton has made that statement as well that we, right. we retain the right to refer individually. Yeah, yeah. So, so we are fully aware of our constitutional okay. opportunities to actually challenge anything that the CCG okay. proposes in a formal consultation to South West London. I'd also ask you to actually um, engage um, a, a company to actually examine the proposals and see what impact they will have on your constituents. Because you have done, Merton and Sutton have done that before, and I'm asking you to do it again in good time to be ready for any consultation process. We would have to, I'd have to seek advice from officers on that one regarding how we as a South West London group would have the resources to do uh, any independent checking. Um, we can challenge anything that the CCG uh, have put forward. We can ask them to go away and bring us the evidence. That's what the scrutiny committee is about. So, so that's our, our way of actually challenging our CCG. And our officers here behind us will go away and look at some research and evidence and they will talk to CCG officers if we feel as members that we actually need to uh, in, enhance our knowledge of particular areas that the CCG put forward in a formal consultation. 
Okay, but I know for a fact that Sutton and Burton both employed a company to do that very job for them and using experts on healthcare provision to look at that and come back with decisions and impacts on the community and I would ask you to do the consideration. As I said, we haven't had a formal um, okay. uh, consul consultation proposed yet against okay. certain proposals. If you want to concentrate on the uh, estates, okay. leader, you, I know you've already brought up with Merton CCG, um, but if you want to bring it up here, we can okay. ask uh, in a wider context regarding the estates element that you have concerns about. Okay, as I understand it, if there are significant changes in, in um, health provision in an area, it should go to public consultation. I would say that the sale of 20% of the land and buildings of Epsom Hospital are a significant change and should have gone to public consultation. I think it's appalling that 20% of the land has been declared surplus and not fit for purpose, when in fact it was more or less fully occupied and fully used. There were clinics there, there were offices there, there were staff accommodation, and they had 41 notices to leave have been issued to 41 people. Lots of stuff was there, it was in full use, they have sold it without public consultation, they are, it's going to probably cost them more than the measly profits they've made to reprovide the services that were in brick built buildings and they're going to reprovide them in quarter cabins with a thin layer of bricks on the surface to look as if they're brick buildings. They were offered, it turns out, that they were told by uh, Epsom Council that they very much, if they had to sell it, had to be for health reasons or for social What's reasons. What's your concern? My concern is... The my IHT provision and the recommendations that we are expecting over the following months to come from the joint season. My concern is question, that if, if you sell, it's not so much a question, I thought this was a chance for me to present to you, um, I'm very concerned that they have sold 20% of Epsom Hospital. They sold, could have got 40 million. They only got 18.5 million. Then they declared they'd only made 15 million profit because of costs. Then it turned out, buried in board papers, that in fact they've only made 11.6 million profit from that sale. And it's going to cost them more than that to reprovide what we've lost. And it gives a scant opportunity to, to provide health care for the local population that's expected to rise by something like 25% in the next 20 years. And they have the same plans to do the same sort of thing at St. Helia Hospital. And they are, they are selling off our NHS and they're robbing us of the opportunity to expand to provide health care to the local population. Okay, so and losing money, our money so into what the What I'm offering you is you have concerns that by selling part of the estate, this could affect the reprovision of services on any recommendation by the CCGs. In terms of the money, we there is nobody here from St. Helia Hospital, and I would that is outside the remit of TCGs and us as well. Some of that will be commercially sensitive as well. So, thank you for the, bringing the information to us, but we. It's outside our remit and the CCG colleagues. But the important thing is your concern is in terms of this joint proposal that's being developed uh, and hasn't gone formed yet, do CCG colleagues feel that it, it could be detrimental to running services both from the Epsom site and St Helia, no matter what of the three suggestions might be proposed? I understand that, that they say that they have made provision to provide an acute centre on one or the other side, if that's a decision. Can I, can I already heard that. Can, can I'm I saying the there, future please? use of yeah. healthcare in our communities well, this, is being destroyed. Madam, this committee is a, has a specific function. Officers, I have asked officers from the CCG to reply to your question. It's very straightforward, the question, in terms of the remit of this, this group of officers and us as members had for tonight's meeting. So, I'm, I'm over to you, please, colleagues, from CCG. Great. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just sticking to, to the issue around uh, the IHT programme, uh, we're very confident as a CCG, we're involved in discussions around the sale of the land, and we received assurance that the sale of the land would have absolutely no impact on the potential option of a reprovision of acute centre at the Epsom site and therefore the future provision of healthcare on that site. So we are assured of that 
and uh, that will be clear in the <coughs> consultation paper. So that was one of the checks we did before formally supporting the sale. Yeah. Colleagues, uh, councillors, colleagues, anybody want to? Uh, yes, please. Um, uh, when when the land was sold, in, I understand there were some buildings as well. And um, can you say what services were being provided out of those buildings? Health services. Um, I can't give you the details this evening. As as, 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 as is stated, there were clinical services uh, uh, operating and non-clinical services operating on the on the areas that uh, were sold. Uh, that has been reprovided in the existing site and where it's non, there are some elements of the non-clinical services that I understand have been provided elsewhere. I haven't got the detail to hand this evening, but uh, absolutely no, no reduction in services as a result of that sale at all. Well, you, you, you know no sorry, I'll ask my colleagues so if they want to ask a question. Um, I, uh, thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. This, um, uh, it was raised that, um, um, in effect, that the income raised was less than um, had originally been published. Um, that may or may not be the case. I, um, I've got um, the so, uh, yeah. so the question that I would have for this committee in terms of um, the IHT is um, whether um, capital needed to re-provide um, uh, uh, or reorganisation of the hospitals uh, is that dependent um, on the trust raising enough money from local sales, or uh, is the budget uh, available regardless of what um, capital receipts come in? Yeah, just, just sticking to the issues around around this program, there is not a correlation between the set of that land and the capital required for this reprovision program. So that wasn't about the question. The question is whether. Uh, the overall, uh, whether, whether capital disposal, land disposal overall is required as part of the IHT programme, and are you confident that that is, um, that having that heard of that maybe we're not getting the land values that uh, was expected, um, that you're still completely confident that land disposals are not, right. with targets or not, so, are not so, uh, I think I'll ask the I'll try to ask the question, colleagues may need to come to help me, but, but, but in terms of this, business case, there is not a reliance on uh, land disposals as a funding source for, for the capital in this Yeah, I'm just checking with colleagues so to make sure I've got all sites covered in that statement, but that's my understanding. Can, can I just say that my concern is that you've sold land oh, oh, and sorry. made a loss because it's going to cost you more than you can to We need to finish it there because these colleagues here have not sold the land. They are not excellence and Helia Trust. They are the CCG commissioners. Yes. So, the, I would suggest, have you tried to address and, and spoken to the Chief Executive and the Chair of the I Trust? Have, I have, but, but yeah. what I would ask the CCG members is, is it not their responsibility to look to the long-term future of healthcare in our area? And if it is, that is part of your remit, you ought to make sure that there's sufficient land and, and capability to provide health care for the area in the longer and not just in the next couple of years. just had that confirmed by colleagues that that, has, that sale and release of land has no effect on moving forward for this IHC program. No, I'm sorry. But, uh, that, I, that was I, reassured I, that I, they said they've got... Madam, them. Madam, I, I, we, we've had, had your discussion and your points. This is a very strict committee in terms of our remit and the remit that we're talking to the CCG. Once it goes formal, then we will have an opportunity to, to discuss the formal consultation.
involved in that planning from the beginning, not wait to be informed at the behest of the CCGs or the trusts. Right. Could someone from my CCG colleagues make a comment? Uh, Sandra has referred to the STP plan, not the IHT plan. So I think maybe you could explain yeah. if there is a difference in those two processes. So the STP, which actually predates me, it's quite, quite a, an old plan now, was published a, a number of years ago. And, and I think you're absolutely right in what it said originally, but there was a refresh of the STP in South West London where we made a full commitment that we would require all the hospitals in South West London, but that we had a significant issue around Epsom St. Helier. Uh, which actually was the start of the IHT programme where we said actually we needed to consolidate some services but all hospitals would still stay, it would just be that they may have some different services on them. So that refresh happened in October, November 2017. I will say that we are currently in the process of a new plan because there is a long term plan for the NHS and we will be uh, talking to our, our partners over the coming uh, few weeks about that and we hope to be publishing those in November but but part of that is that's a partnership so we're talking to our local authority colleagues and they have had involvement in the development of that our providers and and all of our other sort of voluntary sector organizations that are involved in our STP and then when we've got that into a position where we can publish that we will do that and that will be around about November and that will be the new plan and we will build on the refresh that we had in 2017. So there will be no changes to the um, commitment that we made in South London that we're not chatting hospitals and actually what we are doing is we've got one significant issue which is Epsom St Helia but all the other hospitals will remain as is. So, which is exactly so, 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 the same so, so, as the I think most of my um, answer, questions have been answered anyway because it was to do with the money. Um, if the money, if the land was sold for less than the value, um, then we need to look at it. However, you said that it doesn't matter because, it, uh, it sounded like that anyway, that it didn't matter because you had other funding. So could you correct that or explain? Yeah, it, just, just, just to be just to be clear, it's not I think it's appropriate for me to respond to detail on the uh, the sale of the capital receipt and the profit that because that's a trust issue. Um, and uh, so I'm not going to respond on, on that issue. What I, what, I, what I can say is there is no correlation between that sale of land and the IHT program and how it's sourcing capital for the IHT program. So as far as this program is concerned, there's no correlation. In terms of the, the sale, the profit, and the use of that profit to reinvest in the present Epsom site, that is a question that the trust would need to respond to. And it's not in the remit of the IHT program. Okay, thank you. Right. I'm proposing now to shut this item down. Thank you very much. There will be opportunities, as I said earlier, to go through when it becomes a more formal and mandatory scrutiny of community. We will be collecting evidence uh, from CCG colleagues, from clinicians, etc., etc., moving forward. So thank you very much, uh, and I will address your issues around the estate to, uh, to the trust board. Uh, thank you. And can you please take note, it, it was just said that they've been consulting with you on this plan, and yet you haven't seen it yet. How have they consulted with you? Uh, I think you've got the process a little bit yes. out of kilter. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, okay. thank you very much. And I will say we've been working with our partners, which include the local authorities. We will be talking to our local authorities over the coming weeks before we publish in November. That's what, that's what I say. Uh, and I would say that there has been dialogue around the changes in the NHS with scrutiny chairs um, across South West London, whether it be their own uh, managing director or other officers from the CCG. So there has been a lot of uh, two-way dialogue between councils and the CCG regarding changes within, uh, within the NHS that are happening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Colleagues, could we now move to the, the written uh, agenda? And uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, an update uh, from Andrew regarding the uh, Health Improvement uh, Programme update. Thank, thank you, uh, Chair. So I'll, I'll try and uh, keep, keep this brief. So I think when we uh, last met, we had just, I think, published um, the stakeholder briefing, um, which I think is the minutes um, record. That set out really all of the work that we've done to date in terms of considering the evidence from each of the uh, elements of the 
work program for improving healthcare together and that we had uh, synthesised all of that work into a uh, published briefing that set out our thinking to date uh, and as colleagues will remember uh, and for those who've read the stakeholder briefing we also indicated uh, uh, where each of the options were currently in terms of uh, their ranking considering the evidence from all those uh, work streams um, uh, and I think from publishing that uh, there have of course been uh, ongoing discussions throughout the summer and uh, we've had uh, uh, it's not a consultation, it was an important, I think, uh, publishing point really for all the work that we've done to date. We've had various responses to that uh, as we've gone around and had uh, a dialogue uh, continuing. But the most of the work that we've done during the summer has been uh, focused on the uh, regional assurance um, that we uh, have to go through in order to uh, test our plans. And that covers both the financial and non-financial elements of the uh, work to date. Um, and we have to do that in order to make sure that our regulators are comfortable uh, and feel as though they have interrogated, I think, all aspects of our work uh, to date in terms of the pre-consultation business case. That work is nearing completion, and we're hoping that within the next uh, uh, couple of weeks that we're able then to move quite quickly towards the national assurance process, and that has a two-stage uh, part to it. The first is that we have to go to the overview group for strip for service change and re reconfiguration. That's a, a committee of uh, NHS England, NHS Improvement, that, that will work together to test our proposals against a number of the assurance tests that um, are well documented, but as I think I've reminded this committee before, those tests are described in the document now, which is, uh, I think, just over two years old. It's called uh, Planning, Assuring, and Delivering Service Change. Um, and uh, we hope that we will successfully complete uh, that uh, review. And only at that point, then, can we move to the next stage, uh, uh, where there is still some uncertainty, it's fair to say, where we would be required to go before a national committee uh, uh, to look at the uh, securing the capital. Uh, for um, uh, implementing any of our uh, proposals. And of course, as we've said, just to remind this committee that we will not go to formal consultation until we've secured support in principle for, for the capital. So uh, it's best to say that I think we're, we're continuing to move forward through the processes um, and that we hope to move next into the uh, national insurance process. Um, that's my report. Colleagues, anybody want to, want to pick anything up? Councillor Fraser. Thank you, Chair. Um, in medicine, um, I think, well, we're, we've been going through all of this for a very long time. Um, St. Elia Hospital, we really value the hospital and um, the people around value it, and it has a very long history. Um, the leader sent a letter recently, which I think everybody should have seen. If not, I have a copy, you can have a look at it. Um, and it sets out different things. It was sent in on the 10th of September. Um, we are very disappointed at the pre-council consultation case because we don't really know what you're saying, apart from saying that St. Helier will be ranked lower. I'm from a health background, and when you mention district hospitals, I know exactly what you're talking about. And if you start taking cases, um, places away in services from Centennial, you can just see it being downgraded more and more. And so do you have any comment on that before I say anything else, please? I don't know who might want to ask. Um, I, mean, I, can, I can talk about um, the district hospital model, which, which I think you were saying, um, was a, a downgrading. I, I think. I think. Well, when we talk about the district hospital model in the in the clinical model that we're describing, um, the clinicians involved are actually quite excited about the district hospital element of the proposal because we think it's a real enhancement to the services we can provide to certain cohorts of patients. At the moment, um, a lot of our frail elderly patients who end up going through. Um, the major acute services part of our hospitals um, probably don't get the standard of care that we think they deserve and the district hospital model is a really focused um, bed base where patients will 
be in those beds because they need much more support, re rehabilitation, a kind of comprehensive multidisciplinary approach to their care. And we think if we get the right patients in those beds, we'll be able to get them out of hospital quicker, uh, in a much better state. Um, and what we know is that the outcomes for those patients will then be much better because we know the more time that frail elderly patients spend in hospital, the more they deteriorate and actually then it's more difficult to get them back to the right level of function once they get out of hospital. So um, w we think that rather than it being a downgrading in terms of the district hospital beds, it's actually a real enhancement to the care of patients. <laughs> I think just add something to that. The district hospitals that I've seen in the past, and I've been in the health service since 1967, um, shows that you get rid of casualty, you get rid of most of the acute areas. And I hear what you're saying about better care, but that sounds to me like a care home. Yeah. Um, however, um, would you then be coming, doing any further work to make sure that the care is going to be a good standard of care and will we at any point be involved or be told about it or is it just well, consultation, the, consultation without us? There's a number of things going on the district hospital side. So I talked about the, the beds themselves. Um, the other things we're proposing for all the district hospital sites is an urgent treatment centre and what we call same day emergency care. So the, a, a large percentage of those patients who are ending up going through A&E can be dealt with much better in an urgent treatment centre and can be dealt with much quicker. Um, so, so there will be urgent care on all the district hospital sites. Um, there'll be same day emergency care, which means that um, when patients are picked up by their GP or by some other um, member of the health system, and they need an urgent medical or surgical opinion, and that can be delivered on the district hospital sites as well without them having to be admitted through A&E. So they can then be dealt with more rapidly by a senior member of the clinical team and get the right investigations done quickly so that a, can decision, a decision can be made. And often we can avoid an unnecessary hospital admission for those patients when you can get that rapid assessment. So that will be in place on all the district hospital sites. We will have a full range of diagnostics on all the district hospital sites which will support outpatient care. In the future, we expect outpatients to be delivered differently. So we expect a lot of patients who are currently going through outpatients to be better managed by the primary care networks. Or so the services aligned to general practice. But those patients who still need to go through outpatients, they will be dealt with on the district hospital sites. So a lot of activity that we currently see in both Epsom and St Helier hospitals, um, we reckon about 80% of that activity will still be able to be delivered from the district hospital sites. What's 85? Just to, just to say that um, we need that. Sorry. We need that in writing somewhere so that we can make people feel as if they're being listened to, including the council that is. And at the moment, it sounds like everybody is guessing. And um, some people are involved, and some people are not involved. And that involves the residents, too. And so if we can have that, and if we can have this minute that we're asking to have an impact assessment done, please. So, so, so it is in writing, because it's in, it's in all the, the paperwork that we've produced to date. And it's in the pre-consultation business case, so so that has that has always been set out in the paperwork we've produced. I think we feel we we have listened to um, the population in terms of when we've done previous work. There's, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of um, worry about St Helier where Epsom Hospital being closed. We've listened to that, and we're very clear. None of, none of the options involve the closure of Epsom or St Helier Hospital and we're committing to whatever, wherever we put the major acute services to still have a large range of services on the Epsom and St Helier sites. Whether, whether the major acute site is Epsom, Sutton or St Helier, um, what is quite assuring for us as Merton CCG is that the district hospital services that are guaranteed to stay on the St Helier site, whatever, will provide, provide um, care for a, a lot of our most vulnerable patients, our frail elderly patients in Merton, and, and we think it would be a real um, enhancement to what they're currently getting from the St. Helier site as it stands. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you. I just uh, I'll put both my two questions in one, into one. 
Uh, one's on time scales, one's on risks. Um, so it would be great to get an understanding of where you think you are with your time scales. Um, and secondly, um, uh, it would be great to understand what you are understanding, what you think the risks are currently. Um, I've written down Brexit, no decision, long delay, uh, uh, I won't talk about, uh, you know, so I just feel uh, it's always really important for me when people are doing lots of work on this, because as I said, I sat down around me about 20 years ago um, and um, see all people have retired long ago. Um, so uh, the sad thing is I may be here in 20 years' time and maybe the same story. <laughs> None of us hope that, I certainly don't know that. But, anyway. So, so I'll, I'll give a go on the time scales just because um, you're absolutely right. Uh, what I would say is that we, it has been going on for 20 years and I think everyone is in agreement that we need to do something and that this is our time and that we, are, we have got to a position where we have got a model that the clinicians are fully supportive of. We've got a model actually where we've had assessments by the national teams, by the, um, the local clinical teams in both London and the South that have said they support the model. We are doing a huge amount of work um, with uh, local people and with our um, own CCGs and the hospital staff to, to, to get their views on, on what we're doing and it feels as if it is in the right place and if we do not uh, do this then we we have significant problems and we've set those out um, in our case for change so so we all agree that this this must happen and it must happen as soon as possible and that actually we think that we are in a really good position to, to, to make this happen. Um, our big problem at the moment is access to capital funding. Um, we, what we are asking for actually is a significant investment in this area, one of the biggest investments in the NHS for in the last 10 years. So, so this is a significant opportunity for this area for really high quality care, really high quality buildings for our local populations if we are successful. Uh, so, we, so we understand that, that that kind of level of commitment by both the government and by the NHS is, is will take uh, time to get through. However, we are hopeful that uh, our case is very, very strong, that actually um, financially it makes sense, clinically it makes sense, and for the future it makes sense for our local populations. And on that basis that we have a good chance of being successful through this process. Therefore, um, we will await the decision both by the, uh, the NHS and Department of Health and the Treasury. Uh, we are hopeful that you know, the announcements that are being made uh, by the government currently around investment in the NHS and particularly in the states and infrastructure may well help us. Uh, but we will not know that until we've had some announcements or some uh, formal um, advice from the national team. So, so we are, we just have to wait. I, I cannot, um, I, I, I just don't know what the future is, but that's where we are. Um, thank you, and you know, not just giving anything back, it's just that um, some of us sat around the table where uh, sums were located um, in the past, um, and, it didn't, and it didn't come, it didn't work out. Yeah. And uh, uh, we've got an election to coming up, yeah. and, and we've also got the whole issue of things like Brexit and other things which yes. may have other impacts. And um, how are they being? Uh, I mean, not so much about the general election. You know, that happens every yeah. every year now in England. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but whether Brexit and other things are the other risks. So, so these are all risks, but you know, the risks we have no control over. Um, our, our view is still, and we know that nationally we're in a good place with the proposal that we have. Uh, we can only await uh, any announcements uh, from the national. I mean, our big concern is that, that if some of those risks come about and we don't do this, that it will have such a negative impact on our local populations. And that's, that's, our, that's our biggest problem, to be honest. That's our biggest risk is us not getting this through and not getting the money, that's the biggest risk here. So, um, and Brexit and all of those things, general election could impact on that. And, and but, but you know, we've committed that we, and we, we recognise that, as you said, for 20 years, people have been marched up this hill around consultation in this area and then down again because either we haven't had the money or something else has gone wrong. Um, we will not go to consultation unless we have got a clear steer that that money will be available. We will we'll do everything we can to achieve that, and uh, yeah, and that's where we are. And there are risks associated with it, but, but we are where we are on that. Thank you. That's okay.
Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> I think this is comment and question together, really. I think for me it's about um, clarity of objective and being able to, from obviously from my perspective, to see what your aims and objectives are. That, that's very, I think, very key in this, to be able to say this is where we want to be, this is the aspiration of the, pro of the programme. I think just <coughs> taking it from a user stroke patient side, sorry for the terminology, I'm not in the, I'll be, do my best, but from a, an end user, from the actual patients in the community who are using the services, my observation stroke question is, um, if you're looking at your methodology and you're looking at the efficacy of what you're doing in terms of moving from pre-consultation to consultation phase, what what is it that you think is effective as an outcome for you when you're making decisions in consultation. You've had all that feedback from pre-consultation to inform your decision making. You've had all the impact assessments done, but what is, what is it, another bit, that, um, that you want to achieve from consultation? Because I look at the, um, all the aspirations and the aims, but the actual nuts and bolts of asking the questions to the public and the providers, or you, the, you, the um, voluntary sector and so on, but the actual public and patients who use the service. What, what is that information that is what you would regard as an effective analysis from consultation? It, have, can that be broken down easily? Um, and what, so that's what is it that's actually informing your decision making and the other the other offshoot of that is you know can you explain a business case in such a way in part to the public that they actually understand that from that process i'd be interested to know thanks so i think it's a really important uh, uh, question and i think this is a challenge i think to all systems uh, that, that are looking to try and explain i think uh, service chain proposals, but also I think uh, that, that we've given proper consideration, I think, to the views of patients and our stakeholders and, and communities. And of course, you'll see from the paper that we've put, and we're very we're very open to how we can shape that and improve it. Mm. Uh, that we're trying to employ what we're, what we're proposing is a range of methods really to try and elicit views uh, of uh, across quite a complex geography. And equally, I think, that builds on the work that we've done already in terms of pre-consultation. So we are working very, very closely with the Consultation Institute uh, in an advisory capacity, who are obviously uh, involved in many other systems uh, that have gone through consultations, but also uh, with a view to making sure that what we uh, undertake is absolutely uh, fit for purpose and demonstrates that we've uh, done everything possible, I think, to listen to those opinions. And, and uh, when we did our pre-consultation, of course, we were qu quite keen to make sure that when we published the results of the uh, engagement and listening exercise that we did in a number of different places, uh, that A, that we gave proper consideration to the, to the outcome. So it would be really important that, that, that Andrew and, and uh, uh, Jeff Croucher and uh, Russell as well, as the three clinical chairs, who chair those governing bodies with the accountable officers, the proper consideration, I think, to the um, um, information that we get from that from, from that uh, consultation. And there are a number of different things, I think, that we can <coughs> demonstrate that we've done a good consultation. I think the first is that we have to absolutely focus the questions in a way, I think, that are explicit and that we're seeking views around the implications around the model of care, and in particular, the options that we will set out in terms of the uh, advantages and disadvantages. We may have a preferred option at that point, in which case we'll make that clear at the point of consultation. We have to make sure that, that when we consider the views, um, not just from patients and the public, but from professionals and, and others, that we also consider the evidence, I think, uh, from uh, those views as we go forward. And you'll see right at the heart of what we're proposing in terms of the, the plan, is that when our consultation plan is that we're not just uh, uh, proposing to do public engagement events in terms of your, your normal public events, that actually we want to build on the work that we did earlier so that we have a range of what we call deliberative uh, events. That's where there's often uh, independently facilitated discussions, either with uh, hard to reach groups, particular communities, as well as the general population. So we'll be looking to make sure that there is, to use a phrase, thoughtful discussion 
would equally therefore fall for consideration of the of the outputs. And we have got a complex geography, uh, and for those who've read the integrated impact assessment, you'll see that there are a number of key groups that we will need to focus on and build on the work that we've done. As we pull all of that together, we will hopefully, therefore, and again, it will be independently analysed. We're just in the process at the moment of thinking about the, 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 the type of analysis that would need to be done, again, with the Consultation Institute. You know, we will commission an independent body to do that analysis, and all of that will go forward to the governing bodies for consideration. And we will absolutely publish all of the information that we have uh, coming from that. So I think if we can deliver all of that, we'll have done a good consultation, and that's what we're aiming for. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Colin. Uh, yeah, thinking about the results of the consultation, um, people or organisations will be feeding back their views. Um, what sort, I'm not asking for promises or commitments, but what sort of um, changes might you be able to make to, uh, to the whole system, well, or to parts of the system? in response to um, particular concerns that are raised. So, so I think, um, I, mean, I think the whole point from my perspective of consultation is to, to hear views, to hear challenges to the clinical model uh, and the assumptions. So I think we're, we're at liberty uh, to make uh, any changes that, will, that, will, that we think uh, are appropriate in response to, to feedback. I think it will be essential that we can demonstrate, uh, as Andrew's outlined, in, in, a, in a clear, transparent way, what we've heard and how we've responded to it, and whether that's a, uh, you know, a fundamental change in the, the option, but if we have a third option, if, if that changes that, or whether it's a change to some elements of the service model that Andrew's uh, described today, all of that is in, is in place. So I think it's all in play in terms of what the governing body uh, would look at. And that's the whole purpose of why we're consulting, really, to test the thinking. And I think that's why we put so much effort into the pre-consultation engagement, so that, that when we go out with our, with our, with our more initial discussion, that they are well informed as they can be. We don't think, by, for any stretch of imagination, they will answer all the questions through that pre-consultation work. We will get more feedback, more challenge, and uh, more options to look at during that feedback. But government uh, colleagues, we should like to Okay, thank you. Um, just, uh, I'd like to in indulge a little bit. Um, what, what, what do you feel has been something that you wouldn't have done and you won't be doing from pre-consultation to the formal consultation? What have you learned? What, what would you do and what wouldn't you do, more importantly? Because I know we've, we've almost strayed into the next item on the agenda. Uh, I think some of the questions, I don't think that's a problem. I think. The update probably was about consultation very much so. so it's just that you have went through massive amounts of work and we challenge you on, on quite a few things. And I'm just wondering, what you, where does that journey? And if you don't think you've done it all right, um, you know, we could learn from you. <laughs> so my name Collins, I think it, 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 it's an art rather than a, 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 a science. I, I have absolutely no doubt that we could, in some instances, I think, and we need to uh, look at this as part of the consultations, perhaps broaden our coverage in terms of um, uh, some of the conversations that we need. Um, for example, I would suggest that in our consultation activities, and I've not specifically re uh, referenced it in the plan, but I think it's implicit, you know, we need to be making sure we've had a full dialogue with the residents associations. Uh, for example, and no doubt now that I think that we've been able to, uh, and something that the governing bodies I think will want to spend some time on is reviewing the outputs of the work we've done in terms of assurance, mm -hmm. looking at whether that, 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 that changes any aspect of the clinical model. We will want to have some distinct conversation with some specific uh, client groups. Uh, so we did, as you recall, uh, uh, have some focus group activity uh, with uh, uh, some client groups in terms of maternity, uh, and children and older people. Uh, we may want to extend those conversations a bit like we did, I think, in the integrated impact assessment. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, there are some specific uh, uh, groups around the LGBT, uh, carers, uh, the Roman and Gypsy uh, populations. We may want to have some other conversations around that. 
There aren't necessarily conversations that the CCG will have directly, because we think that's better through independently facilitating discussions. Um, so, of course, we can improve. Um, and uh, like with all these things, it's an iterative process. Right. I suppose what I would be saying is I think the one the area that you might want to reconsider is the way you invite people to the reference groups and the way they're handled. I think that was our biggest challenge to you. Councillor McCabe, if he was here, would be would be very much saying that. So, so I, I that would be my one yeah, fairly strong criticism. I think you got that wrong, and I think the evidence and, and the way it was handled. So I just really say I think it's good to have formal groups. It's to who you invite, how you invite. Uh, I know it's an independent organisation, but I think there is a learning both for them and the CCGs around that. So, so thank you for that, and I think we'll take that away because I think that's a further a fair challenge around that, and we will we will make sure we take that into consideration. Once we get into public consultation, there will be no question that we'll be absolutely open about all of the information that's there and, 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 and everything that's going on, and, and we'll make sure, so there is a bit of learning there, and we'll make sure that we take that. I would also say there was some really helpful um, input actually from Merton Council when we did the um, integrated impact assessment around focusing on particular particular geographies and groups, which actually we went back and did some more work around the pre-consultation and that was very helpful. So if anybody um, has anything like that that they would uh, highlight to us, you know, if they think there are certain groups in their area that need to be spoken to, we are happy to include that. That's another reason why it's really important we uh, get you to have a look at our uh, consultation plan around how we plan to do this because if there are areas that we have missed and that we could include, uh, we can do that. The other thing is we can do that throughout consultation. So if people say to us, actually, even during consultation, this is something else you could, you could do, we would be happy to look at that and to try and make it as robust as possible. Fine. Okay. Uh, just another one I'll indulge in. and they've done the work that they need to do and we have all of the information available to the CCGs. Before we go to consultation, we will have a meeting in public where we decide to go to consultation and whether or not we have got a preferred option or not. Um, and that's what we will then put into the consultation that we then have with the public. So what we will do is we will have all of the options as we have now in, in all of our documentation but we may say actually one of these options we believe is the right option and we will tell the public that and we will tell them why we think that and then we will ask their opinion and they can give their opinion on any of the options uh, but we will be saying why our, we think our option would be preferred and obviously they can challenge that they can you know they can give us views on all of that but that actually we I, we think it is if we have a preferred option we think we need to be honest with the public we need to say why we think that's the preferred option and why we think that's the right thing to do. But the, the, the options vary in terms of capital requirement, don't they? Yes, yeah. they do. So, if it goes through the NHS system, are they really going to come back and say, well, yes, we approve them all, but it's A, B, or C, you can go out? Because I suspect going up to the Treasury, they'll have one option, and then they'll, they'll say, that's the money, that's the capital money that we're going to send down the system to you. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but yeah. I cannot see a high-level treasury giving you three options. So, uh, so if, if because of the money, one of the options is not possible, we will say that. We will, we will put the option into the consultation document. We will say, based on what we have been told, this option will not be deliverable because of the money that's available. And we will say that. We, we will still put the option in because we have said that we have said all along that we will put all those options in. But we may have to say to the public, well, we do not believe that this one is deliverable because we don't believe that we have the capital. Um, we could just withdraw that option. M my view would be that, that that's not the position that we're taking with the public. We've said we'll keep all the options in, but we will explain all of the information around it. Um, and there may be that a couple of options are affordable, you know, within a capital envelope, in which case, 
then we would say these these options are affordable, um, but this one is our preferred option because of this or that reason. So some of the decision making is out of your control because it could well be a financial uh, barrier to it rather than a clinical or, or a local resident barrier or choice. I would add to that, and obviously um, when we go up to the national team, the national team are more than aware of the statutory obligations and the decision, decision making process of the clinical commissioning groups. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they will be aware of that, they'll be aware of all the options we've got in capital requirements. And you know, whilst there may be some sort of constraint that's put on, I think then they will be cognizant of the fact that we do need to consult uh, before we make any final decisions. And I'm confident that they would understand that. And if there was a constraint that, that, that forced us down one way, that, that wouldn't necessarily be out of helpful. So, so I would say that, that I think nationally they understand the process, they're not making a decision, we are, they're looking at the capital availability in the system. So On the same, same value of this, let's say there's 500 million that you want to, to, to complete the scheme. What happens, is there a plan B if the Treasury says you've only got 300 million? Uh, so, because, yeah. you know, that it's always a possibility there, very much as colleagues said here, changing times, we don't know what's going to happen, mm -hmm. but would we really want to turn down the opportunity of a capital investment, in, but a smaller capital investment in the, in the, in the area? So there are multiple options around how we can achieve capital within the case and it's not just all central funding so there is one option that says we'd like to have all of the funding from the central and then there are multiple uh, different options around how you might achieve funding so there are options that we could do for less than the full capital from the national and there are different cost benefits analysis and that's another reason why actually we need to get the uh, information from the national team before we can make a decision because there are different impacts depending on what capital is available Okay. Right. Yes, sir. Thank, you. Um, thank you, Chair. I think you might have answered this, but I'd just like to get a little bit clearer. But, um, when you say that there might be, say for example, three options, but we don't have the funding, how do you decide which one will be dropped? I think one second. So I don't quite so understand what you're asking. Right. You said that there would be various options, and I think you said, well, there could be. I'm just using figures now, like three, say. Um, but we don't have the amount of money to go through all three. So we have to leave one out, probably. How are you going to decide on that? What, what decisions, what will make you make your decisions? Okay, so when we make our decision, we, we make it against a number of different criteria. One of them is finances. If we haven't got the capital to deliver the programme, we can't deliver the programme full stop. So that, that's a kind of bottom line. We won't go to consultation unless we have the money to deliver the programme. That's, that's kind of our commitment. Um, there are other, um, what we will then do is assess which is the most affordable as one of the financial uh, options. And then there are a number of other criteria. And you talked about sort of looking at um, when we were talking about dialogue and, and so on about focus groups. I was thinking to be representative of the, of the population and so on as you go into consultation. And that led me on to really asking, um, I'm interested to know how, what the, how applicable the lo local care plans will be as part of that consultation process because. Um, how does that put, how is, is that an influencing factor in the consultation? Because I, I know that that's going to come in November. I was interested about the timeline and how that was going to work. So, so, so they are they are linked, but they are separate. So I'm going to say so. The local health and care plans are part of our long-term plan 
for our South West London STP, which we are work we've been working on, as you know, locally, and everyone's been involved, and, and they will all come together. And the, the whole plan includes each of the borough local health and care plans, and it also includes plans around specific uh, clinical areas, it, it includes how do we make sure our providers are efficient and sustainable, and part of that is this work on Epsom and Helia. Um, so that so it links into the plan in that way. But the the other part that, that does link is that so for Sutton and Merton, part of the local health and care plan is how we deliver services locally, how we deliver the community model that we have, and how we and that does link into the work that's going on to Epsom and Helia. But it won't be consulted on um, as part of this consultation. Uh, but it does it does link together. So this, the, all of this. Um, does come together and make sense and is part of one large strategic plan, but it, it's not, it won't be, we won't be consulting on the local health and care plans in, in, as part of this consultation. I, I think I'd probably just say something further about the local health and care plans in terms of our plans for dealing with people better out of hospital. Um, that's not dependent on the Improving Healthcare Together programme. We know that is the right thing to do for our population regardless. So whether <coughs> the IHD programme is going on or not, we would be making the same plans to try and work better together across health and social care, mental health, and particularly to start building care for patients around groups of general practices. We're all committed to doing that across the whole of South West London, and we'll be, we'll be doing that regardless of what happens. But obviously, if there are any changes in hospital services, we just need to make sure that everything dovetails. Thank you. I think it was that point, the link up to say in consultation that they were that they're your including your primary care networks and how you want to strengthen that community-based model. It, it's about getting really good feedback from that community and maybe looking to see who your key players are in that process. And I'll just that's why I touched on it because this whole idea about primary care networks is, is, is strengthening that relationship and I think that would be key as part of your consultation to really tap into that and I was hope, hopeful that that was going to be teased out as part of the consultation process. Thank you. So can I ask you a question, what, so specifically that we should work with the primary care networks around the consultation? Well, I think, yeah, because when you were talking about hard to reach areas of your okay, community, so they really you know patients so well and I think that and I'll give you a bit of hint if I may Chair that um, Kingston did a study recently that came to health overview about cancer screening and part of that um, report was about areas of the population that were difficult to reach and there were some interesting findings from that which are available obviously on, on our website but it really, it really um, emphasised the need for really good um, communication with providers and also an understanding of the population and what stigma there was that was preventing people from engaging. And I think to understand that is really key to having good feedback because you're actually able to go out into the communities and you can use your existing network that you're creating to give you the best possible reach. And so I can only speak from, from that piece of research that it was very well received by our local providers. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Sorry, you want to say something? No, that's good. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Um, so a similar theme, um, and uh, I'm particularly looking at the report, looking at the uh, page 36, 37, particularly about quality and also um, page um, 4142. Um, I have a, a, a side interest in looking at whole issues of the private communities and about how we, um, you know, whether their voices are heard. And I would recommend people uh, read um, the London, the local trust report from two or three weeks ago. Uh, which is trying to map out uh, um, those communities that um, across the country um, uh, Sutton, isn't, uh, Sutton doesn't have any or Epsom or um, Merton as such but I mean like our own ward in, in Croydon uh, New Ad parts of New Edmonton that are within the national um, 300 or 400 most deprived um, uh, water 
that people see as being left behind. Poor communication, poor um, uh, acts, uh, uh, civic engagement, and lack of civic assets, things like libraries, mm -hmm. not to site. Mm -hmm. And I think they've mapped the whole country, and I think um, we need to be much more rigorous in our approach. And what I would ask you to do is rethink your number 14 equality, because there are some very good things in here. It says actually you can solve older people, but, and then, then you have things like reach out. Now, reach out and actively consulting. I would, I would say that actively consulting um, is a terminology we should be doing. Um, um, because it should be actively consulting um, uh, uh, the, those communities that don't come forward. Right? Um, and indeed, the emphasis is um, uh, should really be the resources. Should there should be imbalanced resources about actively. I know people mention that with association, their voices will be heard through this process. I, um, is it like when um, I speak to the officers who deal with uh, electoral registration, they can go around the south of Croydon and they can get up to 80, 99% of, of the register. And actually, sometimes it's easier for them to go, go back there and get an extra 100 people on the list than it is to get 10 people in the centre of the town centre. Right? Um, but in reality, they should really be going around the town centre and spending all their time there and never bother going into some <coughs> areas. And I just really, I really don't think your equality statement, though in, though in fine, um, really resources and equalities, with resources we can't consultation should, be, should reflect your equality statement, which is you know there's groups of people and there's locations, places, if I've learned something from the health people recently, is the importance of place, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, that needs to be emphasised in here. And, and I would hope that you understand with places, physical places, and that's where money should be spent in terms of consultation. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Anybody else? I think we've strayed into the second item, on the <laughs> which I'm quite happy with. Because yes. this, is, this is really, we've not, which, as I said earlier, the formal mandatory states. Yes. Um, I, I think there is an opportunity to, to use not just your network, but yes. all the councils have a network of local yes. meetings yes. And, yes. and that as well. Mm. And I, I think that's really important. It demonstrates that you're not just mm. controlling uh, who and how, it actually moves in and it and demonstrates partnership working yes. as well. Yes. So I think that's really important to come out of the local committees. Because we have, when I look at the area, we have certain elements in Merton particularly, yeah. very deprived, and we have people living in, in, in uh, rural areas, uh, etc. So I, I think there, there is a real need to, to, to demonstrate moving, moving out into the place, into the real community yeah. uh, for this. Um, and I just, I'm sure you'll try, but as I say, I think, I think there is something about evidencing and evidence in simple terms. I like the document, I think there's a lot of words in it, but there is something about having something a bit simpler that when somebody asks their local councillor, what about this and what about that, you know, it, it's an easy read document, uh, uh, and I sometimes like the, the uh, documents we produce uh, for uh, residents with learning disabilities. Um, there's some really good stuff we do, they're very simple, uh, signage, pictures, etc. It doesn't have to be for everything. But I just think we need to make certain, certainly people with learning disabilities, we really need to make certain that there's some easy read stuff around our vulnerable groups. I'm sure, I'm sure it's in, in the body of what is quite a big document, yeah. but it's actually taking this document yeah. and turning it into a people's document that says, oh, I know about that. Because what's the worst thing is, for me, is when we talk to our residents, oh, I didn't know about that. And that's what you've got to overcome as far as I'm concerned. So yes, I, I'm happy I was sort of rambling a bit, but I, I, I was, it was it's about people. This, this isn't intended to be a public facing document in respect of it's, it's, this is not what we will be taking to the public. This is supposed to be the document that we talk to you about how we intend to talk to the public. Um, what we will do as part of the consultation is make sure that when we have the consultation documentation that we have easy read versions and that we have accessible versions for everybody. So we will try and do that and, and if you have experts in that area obviously we will take their advice as well because um, I think you're absolutely right we need to make sure that it's as accessible to everybody as possible. 
Yeah. I mean, the networks at uh, GP practices, I see it's about GP members in here, but they are a real source of actually yeah. people walking in and, uh, and picking yes, up awesome. bits of yes. information. Yeah. Makes your life easier. Yeah. I mean, maybe you get people commenting about it, it's another matter, but you've done the job and tried to consult. So I, I like the document, that's it. It's, but you should know how to consult now because you'll be doing pre consultation uh, at, at, at a very in depth level, quite frankly. Uh, so so I, I wouldn't, wouldn't hope to see any hiccups have gone on because you've had quite a long time in this journey uh, over, well, we won't go 20 years, but certainly in this particular uh, iteration of this uh, work to, to actually learn from, from moving forward. So, um, I just wait to see when, when we get these, I thank you as well. Do any colleagues want to, want to pick up anything, or do you want to say anything about your consultation document? No, so this is our plan, it's yeah. a draft. Uh, I think we've already got a number of things that, that we'd like to go away and consider further and reflect in, I think, in an update to the, to the consultation plan. But we will produce at the right time uh, 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 the consultation documentation. I, I think the other thing that we've uh, said uh, that will be quite important is, and I think it, it picks up a, a more general point, which is, given the complexity of the geography that we have, that we do need to, to find a way, I think, of summarising the activities that will take place within each local area, so that that's mm -hmm. as available as possible, I think, to people. Because mm -hmm. even though, as Sarah says, this isn't a consultation document, it, 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 it's a technical document at the moment, summarising our plans, we do need to be able to publicise as simple as possible how people can raise their views and, and uh, how they will be listened to during the process. So uh, my view on the document today, Chair, is that we wanted to, to recommend this to you, but accept that there are a number of areas that we can improve, I think, within the plan, um, and, and we are more than happy to, to uh, produce a revised version of it that, that perhaps strengthens in a number of areas, I think, and uh, picks up on the comments that have been produced this evening. But, uh, but um, I, I, I'm pleased, in broad terms, you think that it, it, it is the mark. Uh, I mean, you, you've covered a, a wealth of organisations, but what it's about outcome, and the process doesn't have to be the same in the same area, and that's what I think we're yeah, trying to get through. Yeah. Outcome yeah. is standard, we know what outcome we need, and we need to demonstrate that those outcomes mm -hmm. have been got. Uh, and delivered, but the way that we do that through our a vast community of, uh, of residents, you know, with a million patients or whatever, yeah, yeah. and I think that's what we need to, we need to demonstrate. Can we go to something else? Uh, in a previous meeting, we, we talked about the provider impact mm. Um, mm. as a live document, mm. and you were always refreshing it. Mm. And I wondered if there's anything that, that's, uh, that, that has come up in, in, in the summer period that that, that, that impacts on providers or, or are we still working? Um, because certainly what comes down from uh, to you could have a little bit of an impact on some of that work. You don't know exactly what money you're getting and there are changes that are happening sort of as we move along. So I just wondered whether... So, so we're, consi we're continuing to have uh, dialogue, uh, uh, not just through uh, Matty Kershaw, I think has attended this committee before, is that uh, as the provider uh, chief executive representative on the uh, program board. Uh, we, we've made available all of the information uh, from the program uh, through Matthew. So, so Matthew regularly gives an update to all of the provider chief executives following uh, the program board, I think, of, on matters of interest. I think both Epsilence and Helia, uh, and I think uh, uh, the, the, the CCG, CCG specifically, have also given a commitment to ongoing discussions uh, about uh, uh, the, the impact, I think, of the options they want to express to you, I'm sure, as we go through uh, consultation. Uh, a lot of it will depend on the final advice that we get from regulators in terms of assessing um, such things as our planned uh, growth, in other words, our demand assumptions in the future, whether that changes the flow of patients, therefore, under the options, uh, and does that therefore change the overall requirements in terms of uh, uh, um, capital and, and workforce. Uh, nothing significant has changed, I think, since we last uh, uh, reported, um, but we will continue to have a, have a dialogue. Mm. So are we saying that the proposed 20 million investment in Croydon doesn't have any effect on this at all? So, so are we talking about the investment that was received by Croydon Health 
through the national money. This was just the year. announcement by the, the current prime minister when he got in that there was an investment that coming yeah. to the yeah. So that's like the marginal constituency. You know, that was yeah. around. Uh, that was around uh, the, this uh, is political. This is. This is so, <laughs> that's the stream. So, so it hasn't had an impact on the um, the additional capital that's required by the trust in order to achieve the different options. Um, it was it was money that was required by the trust anyway, and would have been part of a surplus on the capital bid that we would have made outside of the IHT around their ITU. So the reason they they got it is because we already had a bid in around surplus on the STP. It was not a bid that was associated with the IHT program. So, so we're very pleased, that, really pleased that, that Croydon got that money and, um, and they're working, they've got a new A&E there as well and this is really good news for the population in Croydon and, um, and it's going to be fantastic when it's built. But it, it's not something, I mean it possibly impacts of course out of Sunderland, but, but additional um, capital would still be needed for impacts of the IHT programme. So, so just to be clear, capital impacts from the IHT programme have been built into the business case for all the options. The providers have said to us that all of the options are deliverable and they are still saying that. They have all received the information about how much of the capital has been put into the business case and they are aware of that and they've all confirmed that with their board. So that's where we are with the providers and that, that hasn't changed since the last discussion. Um, I just thought that it might change some patient flows because we're, we're having a, a different and enhanced service that, uh, delivered, hopefully, at, at Croydon. Uh, and I just wonder whether it, because so, so we saw be, the money side of it, so but what be, we didn't see is those, those with the provider. So, uh, so, they, so they, already, they still have an ITU at Croydon, it was <coughs> not in a very good environment. What this does is give them a better environment to deliver the services that they were delivering before. So it's not changed, it wouldn't fundamentally change flows, I wouldn't have thought. Um, you know, that, that would be my assessment of that. I mean, it may be that it's so sparkly new at Croydon that some patients may say, I'd rather go to Croydon than Epsom mm -hmm. St. Helia because, um, because it's not as nice as St. Helia. But I, you know, you, 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 I wouldn't want to say that, to be honest. I, don't I guess think it's quite a significant investment within that. Uh, it, it's a significant investment. It's a really good, um, it's, it's really good for South Sun, it's really good for Croydon, and it does deal with the problem that we had in Croydon with the premises that were there and the access that the local patients had, so we're really pleased that we've got it, yeah. yeah good, I think it's just, for me, it's just continuing yeah. what can affect yes. IHT, is yeah. it within affecting so, it or is it outside? So, of that, I, so I would reiterate it's outside the IHT programme, it was already a bid that we had in existence, we have a similar bid for Kingston Hospital in existence, and we know that I speak constantly to the Chief Executive of Kingston Hospital, who tells me that he also needs a new ICU, which I'm sure you're aware of. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so there are, so there are, there are a number of areas in South West London that require capital investment, including in NH St George's as well. That is also part of a bid for South West London that is outside of the IHT programme. So we, we need investment in a state in South West London, full stop. Our biggest need at the moment is at Epsom St. Henry, we know. Uh, but that doesn't mean that everybody else is absolutely fine. Good, best of luck and uh, keep negotiating on behalf of South will. West London to I get will. the money. Okay, does anybody got any further questions? Yeah, just wonder, um, having, sorry, having lived over here for so long and all the money and that you've granted to St. Henry disappearing, because we didn't get it, to, probably went back to Treasury, you know, we are not make rent. Um, is there a time scale, a timetable that we can actually see, or will you be doing that soon, so that all this money we're talking about doesn't disappear? And also, we talk about patients, but in fact, we need staff. Otherwise, we don't need any hospital at all. And it takes a long time to train doctors and nurses and the right professions. So how are we dealing with any of that? Okay, so Andrew will talk about the workforce. So I can say, I can say something about the workforce. I mean, one, one of the one of the key parts of the case for change for the whole IHD program was the issues that Epsom St Helier have with their existing workforce. So as it stands at the moment, they they can't get the right number of consultants to deliver the standard of care that we expect them to deliver. So we're expecting all our hospitals to meet the sample and clinical standards that we've set because we know that will deliver better outcomes for patients. 
At the moment, Epson Science and Health can't do that because they can't get the right number of consultants, particularly in emergency medicine and acute medicine. So um, that's a key part of the case for change, which is if we bring uh, the major acute services onto one side, then there will be the workforce to deliver care to the right standards, which will mean better outcomes for patients. So, um, so it's very much built in. We're looking at all sorts of other aspects of the workforce as part of the proposal, including making sure that with the enhancement to care for our frail elderly patients, that we've got the right workforce on the district hospital sites as well. And that's one of the things we've been scrutinised about uh, from the London team, which is making sure we've done that modelling correctly. Sorry, I think we really, really understand the finance bit of it, what the question was. Can you just... No, I just wondered. Okay. Um, St. Elliot, there's a lot of money given to it at some time long ago. I've even forgotten the amount now. And it was banded everywhere that we're going to spend it on the building, we're going to do whatever, and nothing happened. And we kept going. To, I've been to so many meetings, I've lost count. And um, so, and then I was told the money disappeared into the treasury. So I'm just concerned that all this money that we're talking about is a time scale to it, so that we don't lose it. So, so I, this is this is a long time ago. This yeah. is one of the failed um, <laughs> options that happened, and the money didn't get spent. My view is, if we get the if we get an offer of the money we will make sure that we do everything we can to make sure we can spend that money and deliver this for our local populations because this is so important to us that we will do absolutely everything within our power to make sure we can spend that and not lose that money yeah. and that's, that's why like the process say. has been turned on its head yeah. really yeah. So, yeah. so you are aware of what you've got to spend yes yeah. and they can't suck it back up again that's so right. that so it comes down, you're wrong. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Has anybody got any other questions? Okay. Now, we have an item on the agenda for the next meeting. Um, the, twin, the end of October has been proposed, the 27th, I think, isn't it? The 23rd. Um, I'm not available on the 23rd. I'm, available, I'm personally available on the 6th of November, which is a, a week's slippage. You know, I don't know how that would fit in with colleagues, and I will talk to, uh, I mean, I'm quite happy for Andrew you to talk to officers uh, about organising that, um, uh, etc. I uh, know we've all got busy diaries, but. Let's um, mm. not try and do it now. No. <laughs> no, 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 just, no, no, just, no, no, just, no, 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 if there are any additional comments on the consultation plan, mm -hmm. can people send those through to yes. probably to Charlotte directly, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that we will try and reflect those in an updated version of the plan, uh, and uh, you know, we, we work from that. We try to get a date in the diary, but what are we getting a date in the diary for? So I think what uh, we'd like to do is uh, recirculate an updated version of this plan, picking on the specific points that we've uh, that have been raised this evening so that we can ensure that what we've got is something I think that the, the just can support as much as possible. Okay, uh, and whether we need a full meeting so or not? We, we, yeah, we, okay. we might be able to find a way of doing that and yeah. you can breathe through other And we haven't got any indication of when if we do today, I think there are, as we said, there are other issues so happening at the moment. Some of the elected about. members may have more an idea than I do, that you may be closer to, to what's going on nationally than I am. Thank you very much. Does anybody else want any comments and uh, any other business from the colleagues? No? Thank you very much. We'll sort out later, but thank you very much for coming, colleagues, uh, and uh, start the journey.